Okay, welcome to the, today, the second week of IT Services Management. And what I'm going to do today is the more normal sort of approach to these sort of uh, seminars which we run, where I'll introduce the topic for you and point to some interesting things that you need to start researching because the these will begin to give you a foundation about how IT services need to be developed, taking account of the fact that 60 or more percent of all projects that relate to IT ultimately fail in one sort, one way or another. <coughs> um, the Standish Group have been report, researching and reporting through their annual chaos report since 1994. And basically, they categorize projects into one of three categories. A successful project is one that is on time, it meets the budget, and it delivers all of the contracted for functionality. In other words, everything the customer, the ultimate customer, wanted. At the other end are the failures where nothing gets delivered, project may be restarted several times, but never gets actually used. Those are the failures. And in the middle are what they call the challenge projects. They're typically, they're late, they're over budget, and only deliver part of what the customer had contracted the project team to deliver. Typically over budget by something like 40 to 60 percent or more. Late, often by 40, 60, 100 percent, taking twice as long typically perhaps. And delivering typically about 40 percent of the contracted for functionality. In other words, it doesn't actually do what the real user customers want. People are actually driving the system. And when you consider that in the modern process of developing a system requirement specification, the business analysts, the um, systems analysts go out and talk to, yes, the sponsoring senior manager or whatever to say, what do you want it to do in business, high level business terms? They also talk to all of the users who are doing the job at the moment, say, what is it you're doing? What do you need incorporated in our brilliant system that you're gonna get? And then, they use something called the Pareto Principle, which is the 80-20 rule. They basically choose to implement the 20% of the functions, the tasks, that take up about 80% of the workload. They just ditch the other 20% of functionality, uh, of, of the task, the 80% of functions that deliver that 20% of workload and say, it doesn't exist any longer. Which is kind of bizarre because the customers out there for whom the systems are doing things still have those real world requirements. So there's kind of a bit of a disconnect between what we're doing these days with the Pareto rule uh, in terms of our requirement <coughs> spec, saying only 20% of the work of the tasks are actually of any value, the other 80% aren't relevant to be ditched, even though they are required by parts of the organization or by the external customers. And so if you're only getting 40% of the functionality that you contracted for delivered, 40% of 20% is 8%. So user departments, for example, are getting 8% of the functionality that they actually need. Now, this is seriously difficult. Because the real world does not take account of what has been delivered. They say, well, I'm still needing to do this. I mean, if you go back 10, 15 years, one of the most magical experiences that people would have is that they would have their electricity bill or their water bill or their rates or, elect or whatever. And on it, <coughs> it said, nothing to pay. Zero pounds, zero pence. <coughs> so, being sensible, I don't owe them anything. I kind of ignore it. Don't need to send them a check. God, why a check for, ten for no pounds, no pence? And then a month or two later comes a reminder, a demand. And these build up ultimately to the final demand in red. If you don't pay up immediately, we will come and cut off your electricity or your gas or your water. So at that stage, you think, oh, it's getting exciting. I better go phone them up. And you get through to the help desk or whatever, and the customer account desk. And they say, we're terribly sorry, sir, madam. Um, 
but the computer system won't allow us to sort of ignore it. You have to send us a check for naught pounds and naught pence. <laughs> oh yeah, it happened many, many times. <laughs> and so the only thing to avoid having your electricity or your water cut off was this check for no pounds and no pence. That's done. Mm. But I've, ha I've been, I had other experiences, real life, when I was uh, working in industry. And <clears throat> we were implementing SAP to replace about 400 leg what we used to call, we called legacy systems. The things that were old, uh, some of those were 20, 30, 40 years old. Some were one or two years old. And doing this Pareto process, they cut down to, duh, 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 we're going to do this with SAP. And about six, eight months later, someone popped out of the wardrobe and said, <clears throat> we need to run this particular set of reports, this particular analysis out of the system in order to be able to satisfy some of our external contracts with our partners and suppliers and so on. And the project team turned around to them and said, oh, out of scope, ain't going to do it. There's no money anywhere else to do it because that had all been hoovered up into the big business process re-engineering project to implement SAP. So there was no money around to produce a little system uh, to meet up the, the company's contractual obligations. A little bit of a debate and an argument and uh, the manager who raised the problem retired hurt and sort of vanished for a little while until he came back a few months later saying, <coughs> we still need to produce these reports out of scope, but we have to do it out of scope. We still need to do it. We have a contract to do it. Out of scope. Read my lips. By the time we implemented the project, we still hadn't addressed that issue. What happened after I left the company and came here, uh, did other things, I have no idea. I presume at some stage someone realized, actually, if you've got a contract, you have to do it. But it was out of scope. It couldn't be done. And so the functionality was cut down to tiny. So we'll, I'll give you the links to um, the Standish Group and you'll find some resources that we've, I've got that show you how over the years the successful projects for quite a, quite a few years slowly increased. And I think it was 2013 or thereabouts. It finally got to about 36, 37% of projects were on time to budget with the right, all the contracted for functionality, successful projects. And then last year, something bizarre happened. I don't yet know what had happened, but the number, percent of successful projects had dropped about 20, below 20%. Far more failed projects, far more um, sort of challenge projects. So lots of problems with failure, right at the far end, you know, Oh, outright failure didn't work and challenge. We're going to look at three challenged projects today. And I'm going to introduce them to you in this context. And then you're going to do a whole load of research for, them for the rest of the time here. So let's have a little look at what the next bit is. Three projects, one going back to 1992, one 1995, and one in 2008. They're very, two, one of them is, is incredibly <coughs> different. That's very different from the other two. These two, there are some very interesting similarities. And you might have thought that this one might have learned a little bit from that one, but then, no, it's 13 years later and everybody had kind of forgotten. How many of you remember, by the way, not an IT-related one, but a, a civil engineering one? Do you remember when the Millennium Bridge was opened up in 2000? Do you remember what happened when they opened it with great fanfare and hordes of people poured across it. Remember what happened? It started swaying. And people were having to use a sort of skater's movement like that, and like that, so their centre of gravity stayed Wasn't still. That, yeah, the bridge, the, the cable was all messed up, wait a minute. Yeah. It was like crunched in on itself. No, it didn't break. Oh. No, no, no. This is the one between the London Tate Modern Gallery, the big old um, power station, mm. goes across in a straight line towards, uh, across the River Thames, towards the um, St. Paul's Cathedral. It's a very, very beautiful, very low arched um, bridge, 
and it doesn't have huge high towers with the wires supporting it. It's a suspension bridge, but they actually go pretty much sideways, mm -hmm. with a little bit of upness and downness, but mostly sideways. And the thing that about that one was, again, in a sense, a little bit like this to that, the very embarrassing thing about the Millennium Blade Bridge was that they had, when they were designing the thing a year or two earlier, and I forget which the, who it was who was the architect, they should have picked up on a technical report from Japan about an almost identical bridge which had exactly the same problem of the bridge swaying as people walked across it. They had to close the bridge within half an hour of people starting to walk across it, and they kept it closed for quite a few months while they analysed what was going on and then analysed a solution uh, to put in what they call dampers underneath it. And you can see them, actually, if you look underneath the Millennium Bridge, and you can see how they had to put in something to stop this swaying motion happening. There's another one in Tacoma. Mm. Yeah, there's another one in Tacoma. There's oh, the Tacoma there's Narrows was the classic in the... There's a gif, literally, of it. Right 1920s, here. wasn't it? It's just going like that. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that, that does, that's what I was trying to say. But there's yeah. one like that, but it goes too bad. It yeah. actually breaks. This was not. to do with the wind yeah. blowing and catching it and twisting it. And that was a, and that was a very dangerous one. Um, and people designing suspension bridges learnt a lot from that and then incorporated it, in, it into the, um, the solutions for all future um, the suspension bridges. I'm not sure if this is again Tacoma because it's not black and white this one, but the same thing, it literally is going like that. Yeah, th I mean there yeah, are... That's, that's Tacoma and there then are, that's the other one. There may be one or two other ones where they didn't get the maths quite right. Anyway, what we have here is last year, London Ambulance System mm -hmm. Failure, 1992. Oh, wow. And that was really quite a serious problem because it kind of they were getting a new control system for the ambulance in London, and for a variety of reasons, they ended up with being unable to control the ambulances going out to uh, the patients. And you'll be able to read about. I want you to research about what happened there, but more particularly, why it happened. What was it that failed in the delivery of the service? Um, that was necessary there. Why was it that they couldn't get the ambulances controlled? Why couldn't they get them to the patients um, quickly enough? And there were some fairly interesting and sad consequences relating to that. Wind forward a couple of three years, Denver built themselves a fantastic new international airport, which was due to open in 1995. And it's quite a, a very, very big one, very spread out, and they wanted to improve the way that they moved the baggage from the check-in through to the air aircraft and for arriving passengers from the aircraft into the uh, baggage reclaim area. And they thought it'd be real cool, we could mechanise it and use things like barcodes and all sorts of things like that to really improve it. It didn't work for a variety of reasons. Again, the better, some links I've got for you will help you to understand what went wrong in the whole of the project and the costs that were incurred as a result of that. Not only the costs in terms of um, prob uh, actual uh, problem areas, but also the fact they couldn't even open the airport for a long time. So there's investment costs which weren't being repaid by having airlines coming in and so on. A lot of lessons could have been learned from there. And then in, 19, in 2008, do you all, rem do you all <coughs> remember what happened when t um, Heathrow Terminal <coughs> 5 opened? With this magical barcode controlled system that whizzed all of the baggage to and from the aircraft to, uh, and so on. And they got in on the day they opened it. And in the end, they had a, an enormous heap of uh, baggage at Heathrow, they had a whole lot which had been shifted to other airports uh, as an overflow. People were going on holiday, well, I mean, they're cancelling air flights, there were people were getting to places where the whole aircraft of passengers hadn't got any luggage. And there's one particular batch of luggage where, and I forget where it went to, but it wasn't very waterproof wherever it was, and everybody, when they finally, weeks, months later, got their luggage back, it was soggy. 
And again, there are some very, very interesting analyses of what went wrong, why it went wrong, and lots of consequences. And what I want you to do is to research through those to find out various things. And here's a list of what I want you to find out. As your analysis, there's four critical things. What is the timeline for each of those three projects? So how long did it take and whereabouts did, were some of the critical decisions made? Um, <clears throat> and so on. When did they discover that there was a problem? What did they do about that discovery? Did it work? And so on. And why? if it did work, why? If it didn't work, why didn't the solution work? Who are all the stakeholders, the people who are involved and affected by all these three pro um, projects? <clears throat> and having identified who those stakeholders are, and you might want to go and do a Google define stakeholder to find some definitions of stakeholders, uh, which would be kind of useful. So you can understand what a stakeholder is and then find, find out for each of those three projects who the affected stakeholders were. Sorry? What? Your assignment? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 that's a totality. Uh, so th this isn't for your assignment. This is just part of the work for today, which builds your basic knowledge about failed projects. So there are some lessons that come from this that you will want to incorporate into your assignment when, when you get there. But no, it's not related to that. And in any case, the assignment is not on a word basis. It, when you see the actual definition of the assignment, it's actually a pages basis. But it's about that sort of side. So for today's task, just today, it build, helps to build your foundation of knowledge and understanding about how we can learn from the past to try to improve things for the future. And these are four areas which are quite important in beginning to understand how to do this project critique. You might also, you will probably also want to look at the costs of the projects and the costs in all sorts of ways. You don't have to think of the word cost purely in terms of pound notes or dollar bills. There are other costs uh, that, that could uh, could happen, and it could be uh, in terms of delays to j uh, journeys. It could be the fact that I couldn't go on the holiday I paid for. I couldn't go to the conference or the business trip if it's one of the, the two latter ones. A cost could be I died because the ambulance didn't get there in time. That is a serious cost, folks. If someone dies. The costs are adverse consequences in the terms of this. And then, also, there are, in many, many failed and challenged projects, there are lots and lots of additional costs that organisations and people bear in trying to work around the problem that the system doesn't do what it's supposed to do or didn't happen at all. So, lots of ways of looking at this word cost. And it's in this workaround side that one person has actually sort of come up with an analysis that says all of this IT work that we do that keeps us running, sort of, which the world spends something like three to three and a half, four trillion dollars a year on IT, and it's all the things that go with IT. That is about 5% of world GDP is spent on IT, supporting the IT, developing IT projects, and so on and so forth. 5% of world GDP. Roughly, as I say, three to th between three and four trillion dollars. One analysis I've seen shows that taking account of all of the co costs of failure, the on costs of workarounds, the extra people you need to employ to do the job that you didn't expect to be do doing, all the other things they do, the overtime, etc., 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 the total on cost of failures of IT is possibly as high as six 
trillion dollars. Twice what we spend on IT. Now, there are a range of estimates of the cost of the failure of IT-related projects that range from about $500 billion a year through to this extreme value of $6 trillion. Where the real answer is, well, it depends on your assumptions and you know, what you're trying to achieve. But it indicates that IT and the and failures of IT-related projects, failures in the use of IT, are a very serious issue. And if you guys are going out into the big bad world it, next year for your placement year and then a couple of years after, uh, you'll be going out to jobs in the field of IT and analytics and big data and so on, it's going to be kind of useful for you to at least understand at a professional level why so many projects go wrong. And it hasn't changed in 21 years, which is kind of bizarre. And I was at a conference in Las Vegas last year, the IBM Information on Demand conference, where I was co-chairing co an educational conference in big data analytics. And the, one of the presentations there, one of the keynote addresses, you know, we've got five, 10,000 people in a big auditorium listening to eminent people. And one of the guys in one of the keynotes was saying, and the problem with big data and analytics type projects today is that 60% of them are unsuccessful. They're exactly the same as Standish Group has been reporting for the broader general IT related projects for, as I say, 20 odd years. Why aren't we getting better? And understanding, using some of these sort of questions, remembering that I ask questions, teach you to ask questions rather than teach you to ask uh, the, the answers. If you begin to develop this inquiring approach to reality, then you will be able to ask appropriate sets of questions in any circumstance. And you're going to be involved with little projects and big projects. So you need to understand what is going wrong, because you'll see it happening in the projects you're working on, almost inevitably, in one way or another. And you may be able to help get it better more successful by understanding some of these questions and going and looking at all of the Standish Group reports that we've got available. But I want you to look at each of those three projects <coughs> and I, we'll, be, we'll have around about half an hour available in the, during this session for you to work on each of the three projects. You'll go and do your own research initially, find lots of sources. Remember, put them into your each of those sources into your working bibliography. You will have a Word document somewhere <coughs> handy while you're doing this research, and every time you find a new URL, a new report that's interesting, <coughs> then first of all, identify in your working bibliography document you know, the title and all the things that are necessary in terms of hard standard. You know, author, year published, title, and so on, and the URL and the date access. And if it is a web page, then make sure you download it, so print it as a PDF using Qt PDF or whichever printer driver you've got it uh, available here that turns the web page into a PDF and store it away. So that's the first bit. Make sure as you find the information, PDF it, download it, and add its item or that item into your working bibliography. <clears throat> Second thing, make some notes about what is in that uh, article. Not so much descriptive, but your questions and your critical evaluation of that art, uh, article. And over those three sections, the three projects, come up with some interesting key lessons that you can each draw out from each of the case studies and the three together. You see, there are similar threads all the way through failed projects. And I want you to start understanding what those threads are, because if we understand what went wrong, there's half a chance 
<coughs> that we can then put into place mitigating actions to avoid those problems and to actually do better than we saw in these examples. And they are some spectacular failures. And if you then also connect that, and I can't remember whether it's next week, we start, we'll be looking at Standish Group reports to begin to see what their continuous stream of research over the last, as I say, 20 odd years is saying about why projects fail and what needs to be done to make them successful. And as you work, <coughs> Probably take 15 minutes to do your own individual research, and then once you've kind of done that summarization and of the particular case study, discuss with the two or three around you to get to sort of share ideas, bring multiple perspectives into your thinking, so that you know you broaden your understanding of the problems. And then at the end of each half-hour section, we'll have a short session uh, where I'll draw together from all of the groups, because you've got one, two, three, four, five, probably about six groups here, so we can probably get six sets of ideas that will help us all to have a better and a broader understanding of these, these things. So it will be the workshop session in an hour's time, we'll be doing some of this work now, a bit of discussion, and maybe a bit more uh, next, next week. So. That, I think, is all. So off you go, folks. Start researching. Getting good ideas. Good evidence, because I need evidence-based discussion, not me thinking. Okay?